So I'm Cliff Click. I want to talk about a distributed computing, and I actually want to learn something as opposed to talk. So I'm, I am going to do a brain dump to give uh, uh, some food for thought, but I'm going to go fast because y'all are all experts. So we'll just take a merry romp through some exciting clustered computing stuff and then back out a minute and say, what the hell am I doing and why am I doing it? And can we do this a better way? So, okay, I'm gonna skip who I am I and what H2O is. So this talk will be about um, uh, uh, low-level hacker systems -y stuff, clusters and high-performance computing and memory bandwidth and happens before and parallel and distributed and fork join, um, but not necessarily math. This is usually presented to a machine learning audience. Um, so what I'm looking at for the big data thing here is operations on big 2D tables. Um, most any Java, I, what I end up here is I have something that's almost, no, I'm good. Uh, any Java that, that reads or writes a single row going across, where the rows going across are gonna be features in the real world typically, and observations going down, like clicks, like uh, stock market ticker transactions, like credit card swipes, events of some kind. Um, the, the width I'm geared for tall and skinny data, which means that 1,000 columns wide works really fast, and 10,000 columns wide works pretty good, and 100,000 columns wide, the loops are parallelized the wrong way. But I've tested going tall at trillions of observations. So there's like no limit going tall. Um, and I do find people who have these size data sets. So they're out there, and there are more of them, and they come from places that are clearly going to get more of as you go forward in time. Uh, and, then, and then this is all about performance. So there's a lot of fun performance games I tackled the memory uh, bandwidth, the uh, memory wall head on uh, by doing compression on the data and that lets me do math faster because I can haul compressed data through the cache hierarchy instead of uncompressed data. So I hear people talk about JSON and issues they have with the fluffiness of it. Oh my God, I'm like 2X, 4X better than GZIP. Um, and I, I'm doing math on it at the same time. So um, the, the paradigm here is this super clean MapReduce paradigm that's actually it's actually more or less a glorified parallel for loop. Um, parallel distributed reads, writes, and appends where the reads basically run at the same speed as Java Rayload. It's not quite, but it's pretty damn close. Writes are only a little bit slower because I have to do compression after the fact. And, uh, and then please God, don't do conflicting writes, but if you do, I'll follow the Java memory model, but the memory model is pretty freaking loose and you'll lose. It's not necessarily what you expect. Okay, so, so uh, again, like I said, I'm gonna go fast, but you know, back me up if you want, but this should be like hopefully straightforward. I have the first notion is of an array. It's very large, it's longer than an int's worth, so it's distributed because it's too big. And I have an adder, I have an at and a set to get and set elements. I have, for the math I'm doing, I need a missing element value. There's a notion of a poison missing thing, right? And a variable size, I can append elements on the end or in the middle anywhere I want. So I have a vector, it can be very large, more than two billion elements. It's usually conceptually Java double, doesn't have to be, but that's the obvious one. Um, it's compressed, as I said, and I can stride through it very fast. It's big, so it's distributed across multiple JVMs. I do it in Java heap instead of off Java heap, so I get to use GC, and I arrange the data such that the, the standard stock old school GC is very efficient. I do big arrays of bytes, and my whole heap is filled with big arrays of bytes, and I have very few counts of objects, so GC pauses even on 200 gigabyte heaps are very reasonable. They're on your low second count on 200 gig heaps. Of course, I don't have one column, I have lots. 10, 100,000 columns going across, and they mean something in the real world, right? So here I'm gonna show a hey, count of people who have, you know, cars by their age and, and, and where they live and things like that. Um, and so this is a, a data frame, a, a very similar to an R data frame or a pandas data frame. Um, you can add and drop columns freely, you can reorganize them how they're laid out, and they're given names across the top, they can change on the fly, you can't, write in your code the name of a column as a constant. It's gotta be a string that's gonna be manipulated dynamically on the fly, which is kind of annoying. But that's sort of how people think about these problems. So they don't think about sex as the keyword in the, the, you know, the variable name. It's actually the quoted string of this column and it happens to be sex because that's what they're talking about or age or whatever it's gonna be. Um, so it's a destructive arrays model. Um, and then there's an alignment game played where the, the same rows going across are on the same JVM heap so that walking across a row never spans a process boundary. Within the, the tall column, I break it up in these chunks. The chunks do not cross a JVM heap boundary, and that's my unit of compression, it's my unit of fork join work, it's my unit of like dealing with things for bulk batch efficiency. 
And of course, you have a chunk going across in parallel across all the columns on one JVM. And then you can, one thread can read and write any of the rows in those chunks because you'll always have single threaded access to it. So you end up coding in this nice single threaded coding style, but you're getting parallel and distributed. Um, I'm using fork join to launch and a fork join core will pick up a collection of rows and crunch through it. Uh, but of course, actually, all the threads out there grab all the rows in parallel and crunch through them in parallel and end up doing everything else in parallel. And, uh, and I handle all the synchronization and the I.O. and everything else that needs to happen under the hood. So the coding style I'm coming to in a minute here is what I'm actually interested in like looking at and talking. So this is a data layout and this data layout is actually the, the frame, a notion of frame, a notion of vector, a notion of a row and an element are things that are 40 years old. These ideas have been around in the data science community for a very long time. So this is a known good way to organize large 2D tables that you are going to interactively manipulate. There are as many threads as I threw on the slide. <laughs> it's whatever fork join does. Let me go forward and I'll, and I'll show you more, more clearly what's happening here. Yeah, I only showed, I'm, I'm only going across. Uh, yes, that's how it works. It's, it's not in principle, it's, it's required by the programming spec because I'm guaranteeing you single threaded access to your own chunk. And so the actual is, the, 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 the common case is I'll have a, a thousand chunks to a hundred thousand chunks on a node and then I ran out of RAM. And I have, you know, eight, 16, 32, 24, whatever the number is today, cores that will divvy up the thousand chunks of data amongst themselves using fork join, but it's on that way. So that, that this, this is what comes up right now. Uh, yeah. Board one, this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my thing I threw in the middle of what had been around for a long time. I, I'm Mike here. Okay, uh, so chunk number? size million, thousand to a million. I, is is there something about your workload where where that works, or is it uh, um, if you had a different workload, would you need to change its chunk size since since that's your granularity of threading and and whatnot, or uh, yeah? So so the the numbers came about conveniently because if I take 90% of the common CSV files on the planet and I break them up into four megabyte chunks and parse them in parallel and distributed across my cluster, the columns tend out to be somewhere between a thousand and a million, which also happens to be sort of generously bigger than a fork join task launch overhead. So the, the, you know, the fork join costs disappear in the noise and yet it's also small enough that I typically have way more chunks than I have cores, so I get good parallel distributed. So the, the numbers just work out but there's no requirement that it be this other than it happens to be bulk batch efficiency across a very broad spectrum of the data sets I've looked at for the last, you know, four and a half, five years. Okay, so, so this is where, where there, there are two conflicting paradigms I'm gonna show you, um, and both are operating at the same time. Um, and then, and then, uh, then I eventually wanna get to this discussion of like what the hell am I doing and isn't there a better way? So um, the, the main paradigm here is I'm doing MapReduce, where maps you know, from type A to type B. Um, the input is your big data, it's trillions of rows. The output is going to be both big and small, where anything small has to be a reduction. And anything big has to be distributed and go back out into the cluster or side by side to where it came from. Or there's no hope for efficiency here, right? So if you do a sort, you know, your life sucks for IO. And I do a big giant sort and your life sucks for it. And there's nothing else to be done, right? But if I'm doing an operation where I'm doing standard deviation on a column, uh, it's a giant sum and I have to do it efficiently and fast and I get a roll up at the end and do some math on it. Or I'm taking, you know, DAX fee or SAX fee or crap like that. <coughs> I just make a new column in parallel to the old one on the same machine, the same physical hardware. So no, no IO happens there. A reduction takes two of these Bs and makes one B. It's the obvious reduction pattern. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the general paradigm is you extend an instance of Mr. Task uh, map reduce task, so Mr. Task and override map and reduce, and away you go, and that's what this example is here. Um, and so at the top you see I say new Mr. Task, I get a new object, 
and I say do all on my data, and there's probably a better paradigm here for that, but in the JVM in hand on the far left, I made an instance of a Mr. Task in that JVM. Parallel in that JVM I'm not showing right now is a bunch of data. Okay, so he, he, he looks and says, I'm, I'm doing classic divide and conquer, I have work to be done across a data set that's distributed, I don't have all the data, so I'm gonna send it to my two neighbors. And I send it to their two neighbors, and so on, log depth of the cluster, I send out tasks across the cluster. Within a single JVM, standard, fork joining, divide and conquer again, I look at all the data I have on the, on the guy, say that's too much, I'm gonna divide and divide and divide until I have a task for every chunk, and does it just the way fork join does it. Uh, and then everyone begins doing their execution on their local chunk of data, which produces a result value, the type B I was talking about, per task that is derived from a chunk. That's single threaded work, but done in parallel. And I end up with a whole lot of B objects, one for every chunk. And then as soon as I get two B objects, I reduce them immediately, eagerly, pair by pair. It, it is deterministic, so that always the same pairs always line up every time. But as soon as the other half of a pair shows up, it's fork join going to town. They, they reduce, and they reduce, and they reduce until I get a value at the top level instance on a JVM, and then I go up the cluster in reverse. Now I serialize and jam it over the wire, and it goes, you know, over the wire, and then reformulated in reduction, pair by pair up the cluster, I mean up the, yeah, up the cluster, up the log tree, until the last reduction happens in the last instance at the top that I started with, and my results in the original instance I began with in the first place. The, let, me, let me talk a little bit about performance, because this has been all, all a big deal in comparing it to like Hadoop MapReduce. I can launch a task on a single node in the fork join framework, so that's you know low microseconds nanos. Uh, if I have to span it across the cluster, it's time log depth of cluster, and that's you know on a decent machine with a quiet data center, that'll be over with also in modest microseconds typically. You get milliseconds if you get a noisy, heavy whatever, but it's not like seconds to launch a job. It's milliseconds to micros. Then the time to walk over the data is related pretty closely to, you know, memory bandwidth divided by the volume of data divided by memory bandwidth. So you can be all done in a terabyte on a 20 node cluster in some portion of a second and then have a result in hand on that order magnitude. So it's, it's hugely faster than anything that anyone's done before. And in exchange, I have a little more clunky coding style, and this is where I want to like work on. So I'll start working down some of the coding style examples here. So here's an overload of map and reduce, where uh, uh, the map is from type A to type B is a double to double, and the reduction takes two doubles and makes one double. This will work as stated on a version I have on my laptop, but not pushed back to the H. It's open source on H2O, by the way. It's, it's all publicly available on GitHub. Um, and, and this version doesn't do any of the batching on chunks. It just hides this nice API for map and reduce and loses out for having failure to uh, have the JIT be able to inline. It's not possible to inline in the hot inner loop. And I can talk through why that is and what to do about it. Here is a version where I have more interest in state. The type A is a pair of doubles. And the type B is the instance of the LR pass one, which has three fields in it at the moment. Um, and I'm just adding them up. I'm doing first pass of a linear regression here. Sum of X, sum of Y, sum of Y squared. Um, here's the same version where I have a for loop. This is the version that runs fast because the inlining was done by me manually by doing a for loop right here. So I have a parallel for loop. So it's a funny, funny little game. Let me talk through what the code does and then I'll talk about the funny game with the for loop and maybe I should go finish my examples out of code and then come back around to this. So this for loop says for I equals zero to the chunk length where the chunk is a holder for a thousandth of million elements. Chunk at call is a decompression step but has an array-like syntax, array-like semantics. Of course I can't overload square brackets in Java like I could in Python so I don't get the nice square brackets. I have to do dot at calls instead. But think of it as an array load. I just did an array loads for X and Y and I gave you the same cost model of an array load for X and Y. That's the funny game that other people don't think about is you have the cost model here. And then I do my math, just like I did before. In this case, sums of x's and y's and squares and whatever, and the reduction's unchanged. This is what actually I'll, I'll write code for, and this is what actually will run over your terabyte data set in a fraction of a second. And let me run k-means or you know, neural nets and other kind of machine learning algorithm, or just various kinds of group buys and merges and joins and all that kind of stuff can all be done at this like really fast bulk speed. Here's another instance of the row by row version where I'm asking a question, I'm just counting people who pass a filter. So you wanna know how many people 
are, you know, how many unique, well, I'll get to uniques in a second here. Here's the same thing doing in a pin, uh, where I have a for loop I'm showing you, and then if you pass my filter, I'll do in a pin, and that makes a variable sized output. And the reason this example here, because I don't know how aggressive that filter is, and the filter might be a 1% pass filter, and it might be a 99% pass filter. And if it's a 99% pass filter, by God, the data is too big to fit on one node, so it has to be distributed, right? But it, the pins, although they're running in parallel across the cluster and distributed, they are in order. And when I get done, the data out is in order, uh, in the same order it came from before, just sliced out according to who got filtered. So it, it has a really good property that is order preserving, it does all the right things, uh, and you know, is efficient all at the same time. Here's the single threaded game in action. So this is a histogram where I want to go count people, count, you know, just make a, a count of people at different number of cars they might have a different age. So I make an array, um, and I put the array in the map call instead of in the constructor. Because it's in the map call, it gets made new per map. That is, it's local to the individual core, the individual thread that's running. Then I have a plus plus on that loop, and the plus plus is not atomic. And if it was multi-threaded to be incorrect, you drop counts. But it's running single-threaded, so there's no issue there. I just write single-threaded code and it all works. And then the flip side of that is I have a new array of car ages, one per chunk. I have thousands of chunks on a node, and I have 10 nodes in a cluster, I got 10,000, 100,000 of these things. I have to do reductions. So I have a one-line reduction call that does a, a fact sweep here, or back sweep, what the hell. It does the obvious stupid thing you do when you're adding two arrays. But I have to do the reduction because I did the allocation in the map call. And a, a histogram is in fact a small data result. It's gonna, it's gonna fit on one node, um, and it's gonna be the sums across everyone in the cluster. So let me go uh, a version that's done a little differently. So here's non-blocking hash set being used. So what I'm doing here is I'm using, looking for uniques. Count of uniques in a cluster. Um, and the map call just says throw you into the non-blocking hash set, but the hash set itself I did new in the constructor. When I do new in a constructor, at the time I said new uniques at the bottom, I made one instance, not one per chunk, one on a node. When I do that log tree fan out, I pass that hash map around the cluster and I ended up with one hash map per cluster number, but not one per chunk or per thread. So then when I do those adds and those maps, they're all done in parallel. So that hash map has to be multi-threaded safe. So I'm using non-blocking hash set to make it multi-threaded safe. And then because I added per node, the node has all of the uniques for that one node within a node, but that's not good enough. I need uniques across the cluster. So I still have to have a reduction where I pull the hash maps from each node back up the wire, and that's what the reduction is doing. Yeah. So if you do a new in a constructor, you're making a thing that is gonna be shared, and typically that's uh, read-only, and the read-only things don't need a reduction, because it's not a result, it's an output. I mean, it's, it's an input to the thing, not a result. Reductions are needed whenever you have a small output, as opposed to a big output. So I did that append on the prior call, that's a big output. I don't need a reduction because the result won't fit on one node. I, I better not have a reduction. I, mean, I, can't, I can't gather the results together, right? It's too big. Um, on the other hand, if I want to get count of uniques, count of the histograms, count of things, is there anyone who matches this pattern, look for a cliff click in my data set, whatever, that's always a small result and always I need a reduction. So the, the limitations here is that the code's going to run distributed. So I can't do any I.O. I can't do any machine resource allocation. I can't say system exit because I just, you know, suicide a node. Um, I can't make new threads or new locks because a lock would be local on the machine anyhow, wouldn't be any sort of global lock. Um, I don't have any global or static variables per se because they come node local. What would you call a static variable becomes a node local variable instead. So if you have small global read state, you just put it in the constructor and it will get cloned around the cluster and globally read by everybody. It's shallow copied and globally read. And if you have small global writable state, you need a reduction, that's your answer. Um, and if you have big state, it's gonna come in and out via these distributed vectors. And then you end up with a style that's basically BSP, you know, bulk synchronous parallel, but the actual map calls are very easy to write. And I'll, I'll show an example here in a second. So, so the strengths here are is that the code runs 
the shooter can crawl without effort, and it really does. Um, like I said, I've done trillions of rows, thousands of cores. Uh, you write single threaded. You don't have any hot block issues or placement or hot locks or knobs for GC or CPUs. It's just out of the box, highly performant. And then this is an example. This is a, a, a correct version of k-means. I was demoed at Scala in London of the incorrect version from Google folks. There's a correct version of k-means. It's awfully big and complicated. And buried in there, you can see all kinds of news. There's a reduction call on the lower left there. And then the right, there's a map. And somewhere down the middle says four equals, what the hell? Zero to row count and do something. And there's a lot of news. What the hell's going on? Well, what really goes on here is that, at, at, you know, in H2O's machine learning platform, I have, uh, you know, more than 250 Java classes that are doing this MapReduce thing, tens of thousands of lines of code. And it's all been written by mathematicians, not by systems engineers, not by Java developers, literally by people who have never written a line of Java code in their life. They, they pick it up and they figure out how to make it go and they write map and I make it run fast. So there's something to be said for the coding paradigm I have here. It is highly performant, it is writable by people, it is not the most beautiful thing on the planet, but it is performant. And that's sort of the, 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 uh, the thing that I wanted to get to, bring it around to a language issue. Now I can go more deep dive forever, but maybe, maybe we talk uh, back up and talk about what is a coding style that you can do something with distributed? Why did I make the choices I made? Th there, there's some very weird choices I made and they're very specific and they have, a, they have a real reason for them. And yet, you know, I can totally be argued out of like, I didn't do the right thing. <laughs> there was a better answer somewhere, right? Um, so, so I guess I wanna end the, the, the brain dump and I, I'll go down the other slides if people want. There's a really nice, fast, high speed key value store. It's probably the fastest one on the planet, even up to Hazelcast standards. Um, uh, but it's not, it, but it's just a key value store. <laughs> I, you know, I wanna, I wanna do, I wanna talk about distributed computational paradigms. Yeah. The append goes into a different, um, goes into a different chunk. So, so the way that this guy is set is I made a new uh, appendable vec at the bottom and it began started in life empty. Then I, I make a chunk per chunk parallel to the input chunks of age and risk factors or sex and the output chunk uh, has, a, has a chunk per chunk alignment and then only some of the rows are copied over. No, there's no, there's no run out of space in JVM. You, you throw it out of memory and you die. If you actually keep, keep producing new data until you run out of memory, you die. So this isn't, so there's two different things here. Um, I don't have an HA solution. I went through it a long time ago and I did, and it wasn't interesting to the market as a whole. So this is a big calculator. It's defined at the time you start it up, how big it is. And then, you know, if, if you, somebody crashes, the calculator's dead, you reboot the calculator. That said, I can reboot the calculator in, in some, you know, portion of a second. The, the, all the JVMs will come up and will cluster in two or three seconds, sort of, no matter what happens, they're, they're, they're that fast to come up and go. Um, loading the data back in the calculator might take some more minutes, but it's also, I'll drive your disk spindles as fast as they'll go. So if you have a good Hadoop cluster, I can, you know, burn it down and, and eat the data in uh, at, you know, whatever the rate is, 10 gigabytes a second or more, if you've got a decent Hadoop cluster. So that's sort of less of an issue. Along the way that I didn't solve HA, I also didn't solve out of memory. So if you keep making new temps uh, until you run out of memory, you'll, I don't know, crash and burn time. So that is part of the coding style, is to say I usually, I, I, I configure the cluster to have some overhead over what I think the data is in order to do something interesting with it. And then what are you doing with it? So the usual pile of temps I make is some proportional ratio to the input data. It, I double or triple it to do something useful. I'm doing a machine learning algorithm on it or I'm doing some sort of, you know, uh, filtering, searching, I'm, I'm playing the Lucene game and finding everyone whose name does this or all the zip codes who do that or what the hell I'm doing, right? So those are all things that don't, you don't do a whole lot of them that keep making new instances of something the size of the data you started with. So you don't actually run out of memory doing that. We do have a, a Python and R wrappers that play all the right copy on write games where you can have an interactive deal like Python on a terabyte data set and you make a lot of temps under the hood and they're all reclaimed very rapidly. But that's because in the individual expression I write out in Python isn't itself very huge. 
So I, I can, you know, I'm at a REPL, I type something, I get five or six attempts, and then they all get reclaimed, and I have a result, and then I do, and I do it again, and I do it again. So I'm willing to argue, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to visit what to do about memory if people want to go there, but I don't know what to do about it. So, so spin up a new JVM is the, I'm an HA solution, and maybe that's the right answer. I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen that be an issue. Th there's a bunch of overheads there. It's not sufficient to spin up a new JVM. You have to redistribute the data. Oh, for a pin. So, so there's a different model that says I am eating data in endlessly from some external stream as opposed to filtering from one set to another. And in that one, uh, I will make a new chunk when one chunk came sufficiently large and, and actually just push it around the cluster somewhere else and then start appending again on a new chunk. Uh, and that would be a model where you could imagine adding a new, uh, a, a new JVM, but you still have to keep redistributing the data or you, get, you do get weird load balance issues. So I do the distribution under the hood, but there's a cost to it. And so there are times when it, it happens and then you get a GC pause that's actually a data redistribu redistribution pause. But I, it not, I'm not claiming it's, a <laughs> it's the right answer. It's just you know, it's where it's at right now. So, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me poke people some more here. So look at that map call. So is this just like beg for a lambda? So I sat down and tried really, really hard to do a lambda. Here, here's a map and a reduce. Uh, I really tried really hard to get a lambda expression to do the right thing here. And I couldn't get the syntax using Java 8 lambdas to be anything interestingly less than what I'm doing right now. Like the amount of lines of text involved to do this with a Java 8 Lambda was not significantly smaller. And this doesn't feel right. Like, uh, shouldn't I just, like, okay, so, so I'm launching, here we go, let me, let me back up again here and then give, give some more grist to the mill here. So somewhere in here I said, new Mr. Task that do all. Maybe instead I wanted to say, I have a frame of data, so I make a frame out of age and sex. Here I'm choosing the vectors, but I have, just have a data frame. And I said, original data frame dot do all of, or map of lambda for the map, comma, lambda for the reduce. I could not make that work technically in Java 8 lambdas at all because the map and the reduce had to have like generics in all the wrong places. So, so stupidly I, I, I worked around that in an ugly way, and then I still ended up with more text than what I'm showing here. Although it was in line, what I show here, I have to take this class, so the class gets complicated, it has to go out of line, and, and, and then I have this ugliness where up here I'm saying data dot do all of Mr. Task, or Mr. Task dot do all data. And then the Mr. Task is down here because I can't have it in line in the code because I can't do anonymous inner classes like right on the spot without name, I need, I need a name. So the, the failure mode of generics is I need a name. And because I need a name, I can't have it in line as an anonymous class. I need out of line. And then, then that leads to this ugliness where the, the loop is up here and the code is down here. It's like, no, it's quite stupid. It's like whiteboard time or something. Pull up Emacs and show people what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about splitting up and splitting up the map and the map and the two things together. Yes. And as long as there's quite a lot of variation in the style, it's not going to be that bad. Yeah, so, so if I'm going to show this slide, I should pull it up in Emacs and get a bigger font. There's my eye chart. Yeah, so I, I saw that there's quite a lot of area usage yes. uh, going on. Um, is this just for convenience, for easier, you know, like memory allocation in, in one place and reusing the arrays or? Um, is there any, anything else that you, or is this kind of, kind of just natural to mathematicians to use arrays all over the place? And, or did they ask you for other like types of math structures, matrices, vectors? Uh, so, like right, that? okay, so I'm doing tall and skinny data um, where the data is labeled in one direction and that makes it sort of less suitable for matrix math because you're doing different things to it. So it is a nature of the mathematics and of the data sets involved that matrices, they have their place, but they're not like the common thing people reach for. They, they, they'll reach for them if they're stuck. So they go to NumPy and Python because NumPy does matrices and that's all it does. But they, if they're doing data science work, 
they're doing math work on real data, that's not the paradigm they want. They want a pandas paradigm, which is this is a pandas paradigm, right? Okay, so there's matrices in that sense. Here, the matrices are showing up because k-means ends up having uh, a, an array of clusters that you're building on. The cluster itself is defined as an array of points. So you immediately get a 2D array of like doubles. Then there's a bunch of other 2D things in there that are like floating around that mean different things. In this case, commonly for k-means, you want to normalize the data or things that are different scales will drive the distance function. So the normalization is done on the fly and that means I carry around the inverse of the divisor so I can multiply and add in order to get the scale and bias factors. So that's another array that I'm passing around. And then I'm doing k-modes, which is k-means for regular numerical data and it's k-modes for categorical style data, for which the distance matrix is different. So categoricals are things where you have a small count of strings representing things. So you have like Ford, Chevy, Chrysler, Mercedes, Benz, BMW, you have a small count of strings. So under the hood, they're all represented as like numbers and mapping to a string array. So I have, you know, zero, one, two, four, five, and there's a string array off to the side. So now I have these numbers zero through five. I don't want to do algebraic math in k-means as a distance metric because two and four are not a distance two apart. They're different because Ford is not BMW. So the distance metric's different, right? It's, it's actually like zero or one is Manhattan. So you do a different distance metric. So there's a couple of arrays floating around for that. Um, the output is the, the new cluster centers for everybody, and that's another double dimension array. There's also the worst possible row that you want to find because if a cluster jumps down to zero elements, you have to restart the cluster. So I, I'm gathering a bunch of stuff. So the math is complicated, right? And there's a bunch of summary math in here, and the usual way they're representing this is arrays because it's k-means. If I switch to doing uh, uh, neural nets, there's only one array and it's the weights that you're doing. It's actually how many layers you get a set of a weight. But that's the only set of weights that are arrays that are floating around. Everything else is just control math to, to make life easier for people. There's not piles of arrays. So it's not that they're doing matrix or not. They're here they're using matrices because of the nature of the math being called. Um, yeah, that's <coughs> a question. Coding, coding style. Um, you said that they, for instance, do prepping the data like normalization and so on. Do you see rather people writing a multiple map um, functions, which are then chained kind of uh, one after the other, or do you rather see the kind of these large chunks of uh, code doing all together in one single map? So, uh, so uh, there are generally a map call is made for one interesting large conceptual step, and the mathematicians are doing effectively, you know, loop fusion in their head because that's how they're conceiving of the problem. They, they make a pass over the data and they know they're making a pass and then they're thinking, what am I doing during this pass? What do I want to accomplish here? So it's what I want to accomplish here usually and, and that often turns into a, a fairly interesting amount of work that you might split up in multiple maps and multiple passes, but they're doing it all in one shot in their head most of the time, not always, sometimes you get map after map. But that said, you get the more complicated algorithms, they'll have very unrelated map calls going back to back to back. And then they'll have some single threaded work, right? You do a random forest, you have to gather a histogram uh, over the entire data set and that's a pass. And then you walk through the histograms to pick the split point for the next split in the tree and that's single threaded work. And then you go back and you do another map call and then you, you do some other work for map calls in the middle somewhere in there. So you end up with two or three map calls for every layer in a tree that you're building kind of thing. So, you know, it varies by algorithm, but I don't see people doing hundreds of map calls that are all uniquely different, I'm seeing them doing tens. But the, the map calls get big. They have a lot of stuff in them. Some of it's more common for certain kind of algebras. So linear algebras have a base set, so we have a bunch of other helper methods that are run for map for you. They give you a thing that's run inside of a map call that already does a bunch of linear algebra crap to set up life, make life easier for you. Uh, and that a bunch of algorithms use that. But you know, that's the data science side. You know, what I'm really asking here, what, what, is, what is conceptually a distributable coding style? So, so what I presented to you was the problems of, if the data is big, it has to go back into the cluster. By definition, it won't fit on a node. If the data is small, I want some convenient way to do a reduction, and, and that has to be a reduction, right? Because, because I, I can't do single threaded for a trillion, even if I wanted to, I can't wait that long. So, so there has to be a reduction now. It has to be done parallel in the usual log tree associative math. Is that, you know, what can you do with that? And then is that the only coding style? Is there another way, right? 
And then I said, okay, what, o- what other things do you do in Java? So what about temporaries? Well, okay, there's news that you put in a constructor, and those are shared, cloned around the cluster and read-only, and news you put in a map call, and those have to be done reductions on, or they're temporary. So if you look at that k-means example, I have a bunch of temps that I only make for the map call, and they're not actually part of the reduction, they're just part of the map. And then they're thrown away, they're temporary holding cells. Because I, I am doing a for loop over a bunch of things, and I have that array hanging out once per row as I walk down the thing. Now is that, you know, here is, let me, let me back up again here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, far away. Yeah, maybe some even more overt quest question. Yeah. Why don't you generate the bytecode that you need that's best for you using okay. Bezel or something like that? Yeah, right, okay, so, so let me back up a second here. This is exactly where I was staring at this. So here's this guy, right? So if I did lambdas on this guy, he'd probably look pretty clean. Maybe if I said, you know, data dot do all of, uh, you know, D arrow D times D comma D1 comma D2 plus thing, right? Whatever. There's something that would be done here. This code doesn't run efficient because the JIT does not inline this. Doesn't inline that, that, that map call. Back up here. This map call, some X, some Y, some, some Y squared, does not get inlined into this loop if I make a, a virtual call there because that same map call goes to all the different mapping targets on the planet. The fix for that is to JIT the code and manually inline. A step I have not yet taken, but that's my, in my head, that's where to go here. Now, I, I don't know if that's the only way or not. So the other piece of this is that because I did a for loop here, I expose a common place to do looping of, you know, hoisting of loop invariants, in particular of interesting temps. So if I roll up to this horrible giant k-means that's giant beyond belief, and I look at that for loop on the second half of the right, you can see it's wide, it's a little slow, it's a, it's almost in the middle. If you go above it, there's new double, new, new, new. Those news get used as temps in those loops. I've done loop invariant code notation with a new. Okay, the JIT has trouble doing loop invariant code notation with a new. So I'm also, I'm not just hand inlining, I'm hand doing loop invariant code motion, and it comes really natural to these mathematician types to do that. They get what that temp's for. So, you know, I didn't have to do that. I mean, I, it came means I did, but it happened to a bunch of other algorithms I didn't write, that they, they were just doing that. And that gave me this giant efficiency gain that if I did a million, if I, if I do a trillion news, I would lose. So, so the general rule is if you have to do a new per row on a trillion things, you lose, right? It's, it's just, I don't have a way to say don't do it, but your life will suck for DC policy. So I want the JIT to do both of those steps for me. Like why am I, why am I doing that by hand? Well, it, I, I, I've done it forever in my life, so I know how to do it sort of you know, with, you know, without thinking, but really I shouldn't have to do it. This code with that for loop and the pull out of the elements should have been done for me. The lambda call should just take the elements after decompression, just like it's doing here. And, and by the way, they don't have to be doubles. They could be booleans, they could be bytes or ints, they could be strings, they could be all kinds of stuff. So, so why the hell do I have to, you know, do the map call this other way, do, you know, to sort of do it the hard way um, inline it myself and break out the different flavors of things for the decompression strategy and all that kind of stuff. It's because the JIT won't do it for me. So I have to generate bytecode. And maybe that's the right answer. Maybe, maybe that it really is the right answer. I should, I should work my way back toward that other, you know, the simpler paradigm to write and then say I'll inline for you and then if you want to do loop invariants and you know that you have them, then you know enough to write a for loop and then you go to the for loop version. Just live with it. Shell shock, whatever. I do, and that's because that's because the data is big, and people will go as big as they can until it doesn't go fast, and then they back off. So it really is, if it went faster, they'd go bigger. Their limit is time, it's not size of data. 
And, and, and you know, like I said, I found lots of people with these data sets. Typically, modeling has been done on data sets that are under a gigabyte, because that's how R would, would choke and die. And I'll do 10 gigs of modeling on this lappy. And then people walk around to me and say, hey, I, you know, I'm Mr. Netflix. I've got everyone's movie viewing history for the last, you know, for 100 million people for the last 10 years or something. And, and oh my God, you know, I got billions, I got trillions of those. I'm Amex, you know, American Express credit card. I have credit card swipes for 40 years. Please tell me how to spot credit card fraud with machine learning, right? So these data sets are out there. And, and I can keep pulling up. It's so, you know, AT&T has um, rising sort of network packet intrusion things. Uh, Comcast is one of those too. Of course, Google has like way the huge bigger data sets than this. So this is all like chump change for Google's scale. Yeah, yeah, go. Does the source have to be Java and not some other JVM based language? It doesn't have to be Java. Um, so right now I'm playing with Jython. Uh, it doesn't have to be Java. What I can do with Java is have a cost model where I know the cost of everything, and then I can guarantee that the performance is good. What I don't necessarily get out of a bunch of other JVM languages is a cost model that's respectable, but there's a convenience factor, and if it's fast enough, it's fast enough, and then you don't care about a cost model. So yeah, I don't see any reason why it has to be Java here. The, uh, the underlying paradigm of the MapReduce, I think transcends, transcends languages. And tell me that I'm wrong, or tell me there's a better way to do this. But that MapReduce paradigm doesn't have anything to do with Java. It says, I'm going to you know, do an A to B map and a reduction of two Bs to one B. And that seems to have a lot of legs. It covers a lot of ground on anything that looks like large data parallel work set. Immediately having said that, now, OK, yeah, pick your language of choice. There's an implementation for the framework. You could use H2O, which is what I have here, and just replace it inside of the map call with Scala. Not, not an issue. And maybe then the lambdas are good, and you get like pretty lambdas. And Scala compiler inlines, maybe, because it does a full you know, JVM bytecode game already. So maybe the right answer is to go write those map calls in Scala. Kotlin does inline lambdas. I mean, optionally. I'm not sure about Scala. About what? The, the Kotlin language. Co uh, Kotlin? Yeah. It, I, they it, have no idea. it can inline uh, lambdas. I, I've only seen it come through on the IntelliJ. Hey, look, we did Kotlin. They're like, what's that? <laughs> sure. I'm sorry? Yes. It's a very pretty island. So I've been told. <laughs> there, there are many such pretty islands out there. <laughs> you are more than welcome to call Kotlin on the inner loop. I know I can call Jython in these inner loops. Uh, I actually, I'm calling Jython at the map level, not at the inner loop level. But it totally works. So surely Kotlin will work the same way. And then, yeah, and then you get parallel distributed Kotlin that's doing map reduce. No, that, was, that was the first question, was MapReduce, is there another way, or is that the parallel coding paradigm of choice here? Just like, you know, GPUs run graphics fast because it's big and data parallel, and therefore you could throw processors at it indefinitely, but there was this very specific style of data and problem to solve. I'm, I'm solving something uh, slightly more general, but not hugely more general, but it, you know, it's something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so for the reporting folks, you know, how does this work with applications? Who, who does what with what? So there's sort of two different ways to go. Uh, so there's the slides I, I skipped at the end here. I'll, I'll run through them fast. Here's the block architecture. Okay, whoa, whoa, what, what's that mean? Okay, stop. So um, the one you want is the blue box, which comes last. I'll skip ahead to it. How about that? So this is IO communication. We do a RESTful web server. Um, and then we have wrappers for R and Python and a nice web GUI. Uh, and the, the communication through the box is, um, you know, your REST call mostly targeted around doing machine learning and data set manipulation and munging things, including essentially a Lisp interpreter. Uh, and then you got a Python box that you have a REPL, and I've overloaded the standard REPL calls to, you know, data frame style calls to build a Lisp expression, ship it over the wire, and execute it over there. So that's one path to integration, where it's actually two different processes. Um, you can be running Python on your laptop and talking to an EC2 cluster on Amazon that's you know, 100 nodes. And we have done 
basically exactly that. They did a Stanford class this summer, this spring, where they had students doing that very operation. Um, the other way to do it is that you, you bury yourself into the guts of the, of the thing, uh, and on startup, uh, your app calls H2O to say, hey, go wake up, and then your app gets control again after the init phase of that and does whatever it does, and then it can call into H2O sort of directly, making calls to load data and do things. Um, the call into H2O to init it has this funny, uh, funny issue that it says I'm going to block until my cluster appears of sufficient size and it's your job to go around your cluster and launch instances of your app. And then you have to decide what it means for your app to have multiple instances of it running. Um, you can, you know, declare one the winner and the rest, you know, commit suicide and go to sleep and you just have a cluster for the calculator. Um, H2O itself is peer-to-peer -peer and has no master and no slave. There's no main node thing. So it just doesn't matter who comes up for, from its point of view. We do this thing with Spark, uh, with Spark called Sparking Water, where essentially uh, the Spark worker threads and H2O nodes are wedded together in the same Debian process. And then an RDD can be converted into an H2O data frame and back to an RDD without crossing process boundaries. And then the Spark master node sparks to each of the Spark workers launching the gob, and then they go to each of the H2O instances to do something there. And it's, um, not necessarily the most efficient thing, but it lets you directly work with Spark data sets uh, straight up. So that's, that's the other obvious integration path. Right. So, so right, so, so why, why are you doing it this way? So it's not analytics per se, it's the, the, the general gating factor is the size of the data. And H2O will run the data a lot smaller than Spark will. So if you have a well running Spark cluster, if you add H2O on the side, the amount of extra data consumption is like very small, like 10% because of the compression. Uh, and, then, and then you can do whatever you want with H2O side. He has all the sort of standard munging technologies that Scala does for the very reason you can call Scala in the inner loop. Um, and we have a wrapper for doing that. So you can do the same game with Scala, but we didn't clean the lambdas out to be pretty enough or anything like this. So it's kind of dorky, but it works. Um, but there's something to be done there where you could make it interface much more nicely with the Scala side of things. Uh, and then when you're done with doing like parallel stuff, you go back to single threaded work you know, you're back in your, whatever your standard environment is for doing that. The, the, the harder part for Spark is that the paradigm of doing the math is different. So Spark has a pipeline version and we have an immediate execution version. There's nothing lazy about this. It all executes in instantly. Um, and, and in exchange for that, you know, when and how it runs and you get the performance out and in an unexchange and the reverse size, you can't do opportunities like loop fusion so conveniently, right? Um, which Scala Spark can do, but apparently they're not as fast as what's going on here by a large order of magnitude. So there's something to be done here if you were doing map after map after map where each of the maps are trivial, where I would have to do loop fusion games. Now that Lispy interpreter can do loop fusion games, um, but if I'm writing just like Java code or Scala code where I said, ah, beta frame dot do all of trivial, data frame dot do all of trivial, data frame da, 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 then I don't get a chance because of new execution to fuse those together and do something efficient. And that would turn into like, okay, we need a pipeline model or Scala has, or Spark has a pipeline model. Yeah. So I, that was how to integrate with Spark. I, I, I've, I also have people who don't do anything with Spark and and do integrate with the JVM and the, uh, uh, directly, and then they do it where they launch uh, and they, they kick off a, the cluster after their, their own app is up at some certain point and they wait for the rest of the cluster to appear and then they have a, a calculator for doing stuff. Right. So, question is doing. Am I? I'm speaking for the, the mic here. Uh, question is doing anything with um, 
data locality and uh, um, there are certain kinds of things like uh, uh, histograms or group buys where you want to put data near each other for uh, future work. Um, and the answer there is uh, on a case by case basis. So the default is we'll just touch all the data all the time and there's no locality and there's no, uh, we're taking, you know, uh, streaming x86 prefetching temporal locality only, right? Or spatial locality only. Um, the, very specifically, we have a group by call that will sort by the groups that you've picked. And that is so that you can then do locality or expect locality on individual groups. So after the grouping's done, the next call you will do is say, for every group I'm going to do blah, and then that's going to run faster because I don't have to keep flipping between groups. Um, and, and, and also, you can do groups where you do sequential work for every member of the group, but the groups are running in parallel. So suppose I have, you know, a, a billion, I, I did stock ticker trades today and I get a billion trade events. Um, they, they, they were spread out amongst uh, 150 or 100,000 stock instruments of which I then had 10,000 events per instrument on average. And so I want to run those in parallel but within the 100,000 events, I have to run them single threaded because I have to watch the stock market go up and down and up and down. I have to track it you know, in order, right? So, so it's not associative within a, a trade and therefore it's in order, but I have you know, 100,000 things are gonna run in parallel. So I do a giant group by and then I run a single, single threaded thing for each of those groups. But the standard one is I don't mess with locality unless you did a filter that shrank so aggressively that I want to regroup my chunks afterwards. Ta -da. Yeah. How do you communicate uh, between JVMs? Um, okay, so you look on the, the red stuff at the bottom. He says a weaver. So that's my serializer. Say, wait, what? Another serializer? What are you talking about? Let's go play for this game. Okay, here we go. So, so the red box is the proxy for local resources. It's you know what, what fork join needs to know you got how many CPUs and how much memory and how much disk you have, and uh, an auto buffer and serialization go hand in hand. Auto buffer is the thing that lets me scribble objects out to disk or to another JVM or read them in or go to JSON and I don't care and I don't know. Um, and he handles all that. And th that, that is used to build reliable remote procedure call and to serialize objects to the key value store and wait, what's a serializer? What the hell is that? Okay, yet another serializer, right? So the, the, the limitations are cycle free data only and the schema is unknown in advance. If you look at the internet websites on how fast serializers go, uh, uh, schema known in advance is typically a lot faster, but I, I beat that one. So I, unknown, I don't care what your schema is. Um, first time you touch a method, that a, a class that has to be serialized, that's going, that gets serialized, the first serialization event, uh, there's a handshake around the cluster where we agree on what that object looks like in terms of its Java typing system. And then there's a two byte type ID that is however more used to negotiate that type and thereafter all the fields in that object are just crushed together in the end to end to end uh, knowing full well what that type layout is. And then when I say crushed together, I do heavy compression on the fly because CPU is cheaper than network, especially for big arrays. Uh, and I'm generally memory bandwidth bound. I just take a Java object and I read the fields and I write it to a network buffer, to an IO buffer, you know, after perhaps compression as I go. Uh, and every now and then I have to throw out a two byte token to say this is the type of the thing in this field. And then, and then shove it over the wire. And that, that is all auto gen as uh, uh, byte code generation. Right? So that's a, there's a delegate paradigm where I have your class and then I have a delegate class behind it that I auto gen that has the serializers for it. And the auto buffer guy just does the mapping from one to the other real quick and then he calls the serializer which is just read, write, read, write, read, write, read, write unless it's an array and then he stops and he starts compressing as he goes. So I've done the math, I did some, I've done various kinds of testing on things that I'm uh, clearly as fast or faster than the fastest thing on all the benchmarks I ever saw. That said, you know, it has some limitations in particular, it doesn't do cycle free data because I don't, I don't have to bother doing that lookup for CP final cycle and recording all the pointers on the fly and rebuilding them. 
So it, it's pretty slick in that sense. Um, you, do, you do mark classes with uh, an interface to say, I want to be able to deserialize. And that's the limit of the things you do to declare serializable. And at that time, you can do shit like, oh, I got synchronized things. I have a couple other things I look at that I declare like, no, you can't do that because they won't work. I can't synchronize a lock and unlock. I know they're sad. Yep. But it's fun. That was, that was an easy early one that I was screwing around with hand-rolled serializers, one after another after another, and I finally said, okay, wait, I can auto-gen these. And then after it, it hit that, like, the auto-gen went through a couple of revs of getting cleaned up and getting it more and more convenient, and it cr suddenly, suddenly crossed the threshold, and every programmer who's ever used it, like, doesn't care, doesn't know, doesn't think. They just, like, blindly serialize. And so occasionally you discover that your giant performance problem that you're trying to sort down is because somebody blindly serialized something by accident. You got an inner class, it has a pointer to the outer class, that all went all at once, I didn't care, I didn't want it, too bad, it all went. But, you know, the serializer does a good job. Um, it handles, you know, you can say transient if you don't want to send something over. You can, uh, there's a couple other known Java keyword things you do that does the right thing for it, that, you know, sends stuff one way and not the other if that's what you want to do. And then it's used very, very heavily internally. Every RPC call, every map reduce call, all, the, all these things where I have Java classes floating around with complicated like k-means guy, all those lists of fields and doubles and int arrays and all that crap, that's all auto-serialized. I didn't, I didn't say any serialized until then. No, I explain and die. <laughs> Pro programmer responsibility. <laughs> There's probably something I could do in the type hierarchy to observe that there is, but I do have places where I pass gag-like structures for like I'm building random for I'm building forest structures, you know, tree tree structures. So there's a repeated nodes. I can't, I don't know that I have a tree or not. So yeah, I just explain and die. <laughs> 